Hey everyone, Pastor Stan again, bringing you another lesson from the Bible, the Word of God. Today we're going to look at something I think that a lot of folks struggle with, and that is, what does Jesus want me to do? What does he want me to do? Well, obviously, there's the commandments and everything, but, but what else does he want me to do? What am I supposed to be doing for him? That's what we're going to look at today. All right, and we're going to have an encouraging word from the Scripture Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 16, which is a vision of the new creation. This is all up ahead of us. So what are we going to be doing in the meantime? What does Jesus want me to do until that time I go to be with him? All right, so let's take a look at it. Revelation chapter 22, one, uh, verses 1 through 16. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him and they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads. And there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. Then the angel said to me, Everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy and true. The Lord God, who inspired his prophets, has sent his angel to tell his servants what will happen soon. Look, I am coming soon, says Jesus. Blessed are those who obey the words of prophecy written in this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw all these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said, no, don't worship me. I am a servant of God, just like you and your brothers, the prophets, as well as all who obey what is written in this book. Worship only God. Then he instructed me, do not seal up the prophetic words in this book for the time is near. Let the one who is doing harm continue to do harm. Let the one who is vile continue to be vile. Let the one who is righteous continue to live righteously. Let the one who is holy continue to be holy. Look, says Jesus, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. Outside the city are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol worshipers, and all who love to live a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Wow, that's what's up ahead. And thankfully, God has given us some uh, a window into the new creation and, and what's going to happen. And what we get to be and what we where we get to be. It's going to be great. I'm looking forward to it. So in the meantime, though, here, here you and I are. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do now that we know this is ahead, but we are still here? Well, there's two great emphasis, my friends, I found among organized religion today. Number one, that something must be done to either fight for social justice or number two, to work hard to get as many people saved as possible before it's too late. So there's... There's the divide, right? There's uh, one side of, of organized religions all about social justice. The other side is all about uh, getting people saved before it's too late. They don't want to be left behind, I guess. So while these two emphasis sound good on the surface, unfortunately, in order to accomplish them, in order to accomplish these emphasis, three commandments of the Lord Jesus are continually violated. That's right. People show up to uh, thinking they're going to do something great, but in the meantime, uh, all kinds of these three 
commandments of Jesus are continually violated, whether it trying, it's trying to get people saved or, or working for a social justice in some, some way. Yes, they sound good on paper, right? They sound good when you say, but if you're, if you're uh, violating three commandments of Jesus, then, then it's, it's all for naught. It's, it turns up being evil and not good. For example, here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Here's one of them. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. Now, you think about the divide in at least American Christianity right now. And, well, th throughout the years, the divide, that's why we have so many Christian denominations is because they can't get along with each other. Everybody's got to be in charge, right? We're the ones in charge here. Oh, yeah, well, we'll just walk out and start another church. Well, there you go, right? And that's just how fast it happens. Jesus says, do to others whatever you would want them, what you would like them to do to you. So do, so do I want people to gossip up about me? Do I want them to be mean to me? Do I want them to persecute me, right? Do I want them to exclude me, to ostracize me? Do I, do I want them to to find uh, ways to, to break fellowship with me. I don't want that. I don't want that. I'm supposed to be doing to others whatever I would like them to do to me. Yet, in the name of God, organized religion has no problem acting as if the commandments of Jesus do not apply to them. Oh yes, very simply. And when the end justifies the means, and so-called followers of Jesus label each other in the most demonizing terms, it is pretty obvious they have rejected the commandment and the one who gave it. And that's, that's all of organized religion, from the right and the left and the middle and the, all over the place. All ends up being the same, labeling each other as the enemy, as the bad people, uh, as those, the enemy of God, whatever it might be, right? Labeling, labeling, and then all that goes with that is a violation. Do to others whatever you want them to do to you, and they feel fully righteous and puffed up, right? Prideful in doing it. Here's another example. Here's another example of the words of Jesus. Luke six thirty seven. Jesus says, do not judge others and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others, or it will all come back against you. So don't judge, don't judge, don't condemn. Although this one here has, uh, has a uh, sting to it, has a judgment attached to it. Now one time I was lamenting to a follower of Jesus that there was so much judging within the organized church. I even wondered I even wondered if people judged others because they liked to do it. My friend said to me, Pastor, people don't just like to judge others. They love to judge others. And I thought, no, it cannot be. But then I observed people who acted so excited when they heard a new bit of gossip. And of course, gossip is judging people. So... I have to admit he was right. People love to judge others. It gives them a sense of superiority over others, an excuse and an excuse for doing wrong. Because as I've heard so many times, at least I'm not as bad as brother or sister Smith, which somehow that meets, makes it okay for them to do their wrong because they're not as bad as somebody else that they're judging. Yes, he says, don't do it. Don't judge people, don't condemn people. But people love to judge. Now, the word of God cannot be broken, so if God says it, it will happen. And so it is with judging and condemning people. It all comes back on a person. Right? And the Lord sees to it. The Lord sees to it. He has said it will, and it will. So if I'm not judging people and condemning them, gossiping about them, whatever it might be, it's all going to come back on me. People are going to talk about me. They're going to gossip about me, and they're not going to be saying nice things about me either. 
The last example of what Jesus says is the second greatest commandment of all time, the last of the three, the big three, the people in organized religion violate continuously in order to get their program, their project through. The last example is the second greatest commandment of all time, Matthew 22, verse 39. Jesus says, love your enemy as yourself. Love your enemy, love your neighbor. Now, this is tough. Now, I inter inserted uh, uh, enemy there, love your enemy as yourself, love your neighbors yourself, because that's what Jesus says about loving your enemies. We are all supposed to be about love. I always um, have to laugh to myself when I, when I talk to people and I say, well, I just believe that God is love. Well, obviously God is love. God is love. God is a righteous God. God sent Jesus in his love for all those who would accept him, but those who continue to rebel against him, judgment comes. Yes, judgment comes. And so we are to love our neighbors ourselves, but we're also to love our enemies. Now, many in organized religion will say they follow this commandment. They say they follow this commandment, but then by their actions, they prove they do not. I am never given permission, for example, to speak evil of others, not one time. I'm never given permission by the Lord to be mean to others. Never. I am, I am not to gossip about people. I do not have permission for him to do that or to judge others. I am, in fact, strictly commanded to not do those things. And Jesus even goes as far as to say concerning their enemies, Luke chapter 6, verse 35, love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expectation of repayment, then your reward from heaven will be very great. And you will truly be acting as children of the Most High, for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. Ah, uh, yes, this is what he says concerning our enemies, those who hate us, right? He says, do this to them. Do this, remember? Do to others as you'd want them to do to you, is what Jesus says, one of his commandments. Here's another one, Luke 6, 35, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then here, before, when judging and condemning, it'll all come back on you. Now there's a reward for loving our enemies then your reward, Jesus says, from, from heaven will be very great. And you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. Why? Because he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. So pretty obviously, uh, those in organized religion, wherever they come down, or the local church, uh, fighting with the local church next door over, over members and other resources and other things like that, talking bad about each other, running down each other's theology or their pastor or whatever. He says, love your enemies. Be kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. So you can see those who are true followers of Jesus, this is the way he expects us to live. And all these commandments are simply a test. If we do them, we will be blessed. And if we rebel against him and side with the wicked, then we're not going to be blessed. You know, if they're a test, following these commandments are a test to see if I actually love Jesus. That's the bottom line. They're a test to see whether I love him or not. Being an actual follower of Jesus means that I love him enough to follow what he says. Being an actual follower of Jesus means that I love him enough to follow what he says. And this is exactly what Jesus says. John 14, 23, let's look at it. Jesus says, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. That's right. All who love me will obey me. Those who don't love me won't obey me. So all three of those commandments that I listed out earlier, they're the commandments that are lifted up as a test to see if we will really love Jesus. And as you can see, the group of people who are actually believers in Jesus, very small, very small. 
Oh, my friends, the Lord has a great future for the followers of the Son of God. A future beyond this life for all those who love Jesus and obey him. And uh, we have to be careful because there are many temptations out there in the world and many will try to deceive and lead us away from him, lead us away from him to false religions or into the organized uh, church where our faith will basically be destroyed and we will be taught how to not believe. But fear not, for our Savior and King has given us his peace, even in this midst of the storm. Jesus says, John 16, 33, I have told you all these things so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Well, what do we learn today, preacher? Well, here's some things that I've learned. Number one, God has a wonderful future for the followers of Jesus in the new creation. Yay! Number two, the Lord wants me to obey the commandments of Jesus, the Son of God. And number three, if I obey Jesus, I will be blessed. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thank you for the amazing future you have for us in the new creation. Help us obey the commandments of Jesus and teach others to do so as well. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. My friends, it's been good to be with you on the Pastor Stan YouTube channel. As always, like and subscribe. Let's get the word out. Now, if you know somebody who's struggling with this very issue, what should we be doing as we await the return of Jesus or as we look forward to our death and going on to paradise, send them a link to this video. Let's get the word out and help somebody who's in need. All right, my friends, good to see you again. I love you. God loves you. Peace be with you. See you next time.